All right. So uh, welcome everybody in the space. Um, uh, this workshop is talking about AI stuff, um, but really I'm, I want I want us to zoom in on a very narrow topic within a very sort of closed, well, not closed frame, but like more or less tight frame. My experience in talking about AI stuff is the conversation is, is very easily sort of moved from topic to topic or, or theory to theory. So I'm gonna really try to just draw a box and um, keep us in a box. And that box is really drawn around students work. Um, and so in this, in this workshop, what I wanna do is I wanna share three typical assignments of my composition classes. We'll look at English 100, but these are assignments that I do in my composition classes 202 also. Um, um, so I wanna, I wanna kind of describe what those assignments are. And then I wanna show you students work some students who are using AI to complete those tasks, some students who aren't using AI to complete those tasks. And I'd really, the, the goal of this is just to really begin a process of reflection, um, or I guess to share with you my process of reflection. Um, when are students using AI and I'm seeing real learning happening? When am I seeing students using AI and it's, it's, it's uh, distracting them or, or holding them back from the kind of learning I wanna see them engage with? So. It's going to be me talking for like 20 minutes, um, but then I, I really want to open up the majority of this time for a discussion around students' work, um, the design of our classes that is inviting AI uh, in positive ways or maybe negative ways, um, and then and then to ask ourselves also about just you know equity implications um, that that are coming from this topic. So I hope I hope. Okay, I hope I don't bore you for 20 minutes. And I hope when we get to that 20, that, that discussion part, we can all really feel comfortable um, contributing, okay? So uh, to start us off, I wanna offer a framework and there's really just too much. And even me thinking this morning, like this was a workshop that, that you know I gave in Flex Week and I'm like, oh, but there's other things since then. There's too much. So I'm just gonna restrict a framework to just four voices um, um, that I think are help us with the discussion we're about to have. The first one is John McWhorter. He's a linguist, um, um, a professor at Columbia University. He's, he's responding to AI, I think the way a lot of us are responding in the sense that he, he's passionate about his subject and he's, he's seeing AI really disruptive uh, in that space. Um, but in this, in this op-ed he's written uh, for the New York Times, where he gets is here, he, he kind of has a, a this but that sort of conclusion. He says, you know, for folks who want to learn another language, um, you know, they often want to do that because they want to go to another country and they want to be able to participate in, you know, just the day to day stuff. And he says, with an iPhone handy and an appropriate app downloaded, foreign languages will no longer present most people with the barrier or challenge they once did. So just that I need to know the language, so I'll take a class. These technologies really fill that need. They help someone complete that task. Um, but then he has this but. But learning to genuinely speak a language will hardly be unknown. And so he concedes that, okay, even though these technologies exist, for people who immerse themselves in a culture, for people who want to immerse themselves in the art and the humanities of a culture and really experience it in that language, um, he says, we, we will see this discipline, per, you know, pursuing uh, and continuing. Um, and, and even at the end says, and, and the weird thing is it might even be a kind of progress. Like the people who study languages may even go deeper uh, than, than we've been before. So that's part of the frame I want to introduce. Another part of the framework I want to introduce is uh, uh, from Jeremy Douglas. He's a professor at UCSB. He gave a really cool keynote at a Future of Writing conference at the beginning of last summer. And he poses this thought experiment about large language models, about these AI technologies. And he says, you know, okay, let's say, let's pretend thought experiment. Let's say we get to this supercomputer, this thing that's so good at like, just even, you know, the basic phrase that you share with it, it kind of can know where you're going. Let's say we get there. Um, he, 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 he introduces this problem. He says, no godlike entity, no all-knowing external being with any access to all the magics of physics and the known universe can never relieve you of the issue of needing to be able to articulate what it is you wanted. And what he's getting at there is that sort of legend of the genie, 
And the moral of that is the genie will do what you tell it to do. But if you don't know how to articulate what you deeply want to know or, or what you deeply want to have happen, if you can't express that, then there's nothing, there's no entity that can sort of tell you, you know, that, that, that thing. And so he lands here. Um, in other words, auto GPT, when we get there, can only take us so far until it runs into something that is probably fundamental to expression. Can you articulate what it is you believe? Can you articulate it what it is you want? Okay, so that's also part of the frame. I'm gonna give two more pieces, then I'll put the frame together. This piece is from a student who attended Harvard. She made a wild deal with her professors, apparently, in that she told them for a semester, I'm gonna use GPT for some things and I'm gonna do the work on my own for other things. And I don't wanna tell you because I just want the experiment to be, can you catch me? And apparently the professors were down for this. And the, the secret was she used GPT for everything and she got A's and B's in all her classes at Harvard. And so this piece in the Chronicle, uh, she's saying um, uh, 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 you know, about GPT, that it's really good at generating the type of fairly unoriginal synthesis writing that's rewarded, rewarded in non-advanced university classes. Um, and, over, and, and so it's, it's, you know, because of the tasks, because of the assignments is what she's saying, that this is a, this is a pathway available to students from her observations. Um, and over time, the chatbot will certainly get better um, uh, 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 at, at, a, at a writing that seems more unique, that's more personal. Um, it's possible GPT-4 might even learn each person's writing style and adapt the response to fit it. So it's an available tool to students and she's calling out, it's our assignments we need to be thinking about, okay? One more piece to the frame and then, and then like I said, I'll put it together. This is a response from a student in my English 100 class over the summer. And I asked all my students to respond, just to reflect on their experience writing. And this is what the student said, um, that, that using the tools built into Microsoft to help like look for definitions of words and synonyms for words were, were just awesome and really helped the student kind of build a vocabulary. But, but the student said, but ChatGPT was kind of a game changer and, and, and says, ensuring that, he, that this student held on to his own integrity, um, ChatGPT was not a substitute for writing, what it did, however, was assist, right? It helped with organization, it helped with idea, example generation, it helped a bit with research. And then I like the way the student leaves it. Sometimes it's messy, but living in the information age is cool. So if I put all these things together, this, this is the framework that I wanna introduce for us to kind of hang on to. There are tasks that we want to complete and we want our students to, to complete that these technologies are just efficient at, and they're gonna use them, but it doesn't preclude people with genuine curiosities that wanna inquire to go beyond the task itself, right? To kind of transcend the task, right? And that there's something probably fundamentally human about our just desire to know things and our desire to want to deepen our knowledge about things, that if we can somehow orient our tasks within that inquiry, within that curiosity, it doesn't matter the tool available, our students are going to want to pursue them. If we keep our tasks at a sort of like, as long as you're telling me what the thing says, just giving me the information and, and presenting that information to yourself so you're, you're availed of it, um, students will use these tools because that, that's what they're very good at. Um, and all of this is very messy, <laughs> I guess, is the, is the next move, okay? So I want us to think about that. And, and so, so what I'll invite you to do is, is kind of follow me into my own classroom, my own reflections, and, and maybe that'll inspire us to, to chat a bit about your classroom as well. So really quick, just so that we're on the same page, we'll, we'll kind of agree on some terms. So by AI tools, um, what we're talking about are tools that, that, do, that, 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 that do certain things. Some of those things are autocorrect and autocomplete. Um, a voice to text tool or a text to voice tool is also using um, this kind of you know, programming, this kind of software. So I'm, when I say AI, I'm also meaning that. Um, when I say AI, I'm also meaning tools that are good at translation and tools that are really good at association. So I can say a word and it can tell me a lot of versions of that word in another language or a lot of versions of that word in the same language, okay? 
uh, these AI tools that, I, that I'm describing are also really good at object identification as well as subject identification, meaning like what Turnitin does. Turnitin is very good at identifying quotes, sort of like the object in a student's text that I call a quote. It's good at identifying that. Um, but also these tools are really good at summary, right? So you can get at that subject level and tell me what the text says, okay? Um, very, very efficiently. Um, and then when I say AI, I'm also talking about tools that generate um, 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 content, okay? And in my experience, and, and I'm curious to hear from you um, um, uh, if you share this experience, students who are using AI are honor students, especially honor students who are taking a lot of credits and are really pressed for time um, and are completing tasks strategically. Um, returning students who are opening up Google Docs for the first time or getting into some other space and just being prompted by that particular surface. Do you want to help me? Do you want help writing this thing? And they click on it and why wouldn't they use it? Um, Neural diverse students are using these tools because they're really, really good at taking something presented to us in one modality and translating it into another modality. I can hear what my you know, prompt is saying instead of reading what my prompt is saying. Um, multilingual students are using these, again, because they're very good at translation. So a student is freed to think in their home language and then deliver to us content in sort of that art, you know, uh, English, uh, uh, a sort of standard language. Um, and then, of course, any student that is uh, uh, feeling unmoored or overwhelmed, so all students uh, uh, are likely to use AI. Okay. Are we okay so far? Um, any questions about that frame or, or these definitions before I move forward? Okay. I do want to credit uh, Jennifer Gearson, who was in the first workshop. She reminded me that. Um, I'm coming at this from a very like humanities lens. Um, she teaches in horticulture and she reminded me that, you know, her students have been using these tools to identify plants, but they're very good at that. I take a picture of a thing and it can identify what that thing is. Um, so I, I think these tools, if we think of them broadly like this, um, um, we've been seeing our students use these tools for a while. Okay. So really quickly, I want to tell you about three typical assignments uh, in my English 100 class. And then I want to show you some students work um, engaging with these assignments over the last summer term. OK, uh, and I'm going to do this quickly. So uh, a really sort of core assignment in my composition classes is a reading journal. Um, what I ask students to do is weekly submit four reading journal notes on uh, some assigned lecture or reading content. Um, these notes are very, very sort of like basic in what I'm asking for, just 75 words. And I ask students to summarize the thing overall, include a couple key moments, quotes, and then respond thoughtfully. Either here's how I want to use this in my essay, or this is making me think this way about, you know, some concept of writing. Okay. Um, so four of those every week. And then the other thing they do in their journal is what I call a stay on track sort of snapshot. And so this is a snapshot of their process. It could be, here's my outline I have so far, and they just sort of put it in. Um, or it could be um, a step back and reflect on how things are going. This is where I'm stuck. This is where I feel really confident. Okay, so just a snapshot of their process. Okay, so that's the reading journal. Another assignment in my class is Discussions and discussion posts, but I'm not going to tell you about discussion posts. I want to tell you about discussion replies. So students do discussion posting throughout the week in certain ways, um, but I want that to be engaged with some kind of reply to that. So what I ask students is, from the beginning of the semester till the end, I want you to reply 25 times. Um, I don't I don't say twice a week or twice every discussion. Um, it's 25 times over the course of the semester. Hopefully that means if they're busy. It's not going to be a forced reply. If they are really engaged, it's a sort of natural reply. Hopefully that just enlivens the discussion. So that's what a discussion reply is in my class. And then the other assignment that I want to share with you are my essay assignments. Um, so uh, I'll just point to two. Essay two, which is a 1500 word critical, critical response to an argument. So students, for example, will choose, let's say, a documentary uh, that has some substance to it, that has some length to it, so right around an hour. And then in this essay, 
they identify the claims the documentary makes about a topic and then they respond with some at a critical level to those claims either agreeing with them or uh, uh, sort of countering them or adding to them maybe what the documentary didn't quite get to um, so that's that assignment and then the final assignment essay three is a 2400 word uh, research-based position paper um, that really repositions a prior uh, English 100 work. So um, their first essay can become their third essay um, by adding some research and taking a critical position. I'll just leave it, leave it there for now. Okay. Okay. Any questions about those? We hanging in there? I know it's one in the afternoon. We're okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. So I want to show you some students' uh, 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 submissions to these different tasks, OK? Um, we will start with uh, the reading journal. I'm not going to read this whole everything to you. I'm going to kind of skim through. Um, I'm going to share this document with you right when I'm done talking. So if we want to go back and look at it carefully, we absolutely can do that if you want. Um, but let me show you. So here's a, a reading journal entry, this one by a student I know to have used AI last summer, OK? And so notice how they, they format the, the notes. So you have the summary piece, you have the key passages piece, and then you have the expectations piece. Uh, I say response, they're saying expectations, which is fine. Um, they're responding to an article by Steven Johnson, um, who is writing about research and this concept of serendipity, um, how uh, researchers who engage in a process um, um, are ready for good ideas and that another and and it's not that researchers come up with good ideas that's the basic sort of gist of that article okay so you've got a pretty good summary of that got some key quotes and then i'm going to read to you the uh the response okay so this student wrote in my discussions and essay drafts i will explore the significance of serendipity in the research process and its impacts on generating surprising and novel arguments by adopting a mindset that it welcomes unexpected connections, I can learn how to navigate research in an organic and exciting manner, leading to more insightful findings and supporting my thesis effectively. I, I wanna believe the student like from their heart wrote that and that as they left this journal note, they sort of their whole world was changed and this is their pursuit <laughs> every time that they uh, engage with research. Um, but I also feel like that was kind of automatically generated. It's, it's very like, uh, there's a lot of aphorisms <laughs> in that, that response. Uh, but, but, you know, it, like I said, hopefully this is what the student really felt. Let me compare this note with another. So this is a, a journal note. And I see this, this, this version quite a bit. It's very personal. So I'll read a little bit, but not the whole thing. Fun lecture. My sources provided a lot of new search terms that I used later when I realized that I reached the last page of my search results. They also introduced me to topics such as how music can nurture suicidogenic moods uh, and how choir and singing groups can help individuals afflicted by dementia and even introduced me to questions that criticized those said choir groups. Notice the students not even talking about Stephen Johnson, not even talking about serendipity. This student is like, doing serendipity like modeling like this student just read the article and is like or, or the lecture and is like oh i get this this just happened to me check it out this is the stuff that occurred to me because i did this process thing at the end we get to serendipity and we get some like quick summary of the article but that's not really what this student is front of mind in the journal space there's a lot of like this is what i'm thinking and reacting to okay okay so there's that one and then here's, let me contrast just again with a final journal note. Um, this is a very typical note that I'll get, right? So bullet points. First one, here's the quotes that I liked. Next one, here's the definition. Like not even like typed up, like just screenshot of the thing, right? Like just boom, this is the boom, okay? <laughs> and then just some quick like, okay, here's a key idea. Here's another cool quote. Here's another key idea. All right, here's what I'm thinking about it overall. Okay, pretty mechanical, pretty just straightforward, just completing the task, doing everything that I'm asked the student to do, um, um, and then and then not a lot beyond that, right? So if I think about these three different journal responses, 
if an AI helped the student write this, I'm not too worried about it, actually. This is a pretty good summary of the article. And because the first step, the summary step, really is just like draw out of the thing the information, like the what, that's exactly what this did. And if a student read this and went like, oh, that's what the lecture is about, that, that actually can be pretty helpful. If that then sent the person back to discover a cool quotes, a couple cool quotes, I'm not sure I see the difference between this approach and this one. The move of, here's a cool quote, but I don't know what serendipity means. I'm gonna go to a source. Oh, now I know what it means. Okay, now I can come back, right? There, there's some interesting moves happening. I guess where with the note space, where I'm a little, where I reflect on like, okay, the learning I want to see in the journal is really this stuff. Like the, oh, I get it. Let me, right? I don't see that as effectively shared here or or, or grappled with here uh, as I do here. Um, but I might feel that way about this too if I really read this closely. I might want to nudge this student a little bit, even though this is a student doing it kind of on their own um, uh, uh, anyway. Okay. Okay. So that's the journal. We're we still doing okay. Okay. Um, let me show you a couple uh, uh, replies for discussion. So this is another important assignment in my class. So here is a thread for a discussion that happened towards the end of summer. This was a unique discussion in the sense that the content, like the prompt part, it didn't come from me. The prompt part said, share a presentation version of your final project. And it could be anything. It, it could be a slide deck, but it could just be a quick write up or me talking in a YouTube video, whatever. Um, so that was the content of the discussion. So everybody put the presentation version of their final paper in, in the discussion space. And then the replies were just engaging with whatever it is their classmates posted. So here's one thread where people were really engaged. And I'm just gonna kind of like scroll through it quickly. So you have the first one, this is on July 15th at 11 uh, in the morning. So round of applause, the way you related the video game with parallel issues around our world was well executed. Um, this is uh, July 22nd. Uh, I agree with you, it's a great piece. It's an important topic that has gotten its attention due to the devastating effects. Um, Okay, going back to July 15th. I really like the way you organize your thoughts on the slides. I have some strong feelings about climate change too. Uh, July 17th, so a couple of days later. Again, you're blowing me away with the research you're doing on this issue. It's incredible to me. Power of games have to teach us lessons about the real world. And they kind of go on from there, right? So really cool engagement. Student did great in their presentation of their final project. And I feel like in these replies, you have just some authentic sharing out, right? Just some like gushing of, I can't not type this. It's just coming out of me. I'm, I'm, I'm excited, this cool idea, et cetera. So I'm very happy about how this went, okay? Okay, same discussion. And this is from a student I know to have used AI. Um, and these posts are all their posts to different threads. So I just pulled them out and they're just all arranged here. Yeah, I'm not gonna read all of these, but I just wanna show you the difference. So this one's posted on July 19th and says, hi, I think this poem is great as it really showcases the interconnectedness between music and the natural world. I think that if you integrate research on plants and the effect of music on their health, that would be really interesting, okay? Actually some cool engagement there. I don't think that AI wrote this or if it did, I think the student is really directing it, right? There's this cool, I think your poem move and there's this cool, I think if you did this, it'd be cool move, right? That, that feels to me like that student is engaged. So that was posted 11 p.m. This is, let's see, so 27 minutes later. This is the response to the one that everybody else was responding to, the games one. That's enough time. That's a good chunk of time between this post and that post where I feel like this student really watched that presentation and you get the same kind of like, dude, this was awesome kind of move going on here. But check out what happens next, okay? 1128, 1132, 1133, 1137. And all of these ones have this form of, I agree, I think. I agree, 
and then some summary, it's shocking, right? And, and, and there's not a lot of engagement with the actual presentation, the poem, the slides. It's more topical. It's, it's a quick move to re-summarizing the topic that this, the, the, the original student is writing about. Um, and these are coming at it at a really fast clip. Either, and this came up with the first session or first sort of uh, go around with this workshop. Um, it is possible the student did a bunch of labor beforehand and had notes and is now just sharing the notes. That's possible. But I think what's more likely is all of this work was due when? It was due at 11.59 p.m. And that deadline is quickly approaching and the student needs to get things done. And there's a tool that can deliver this thing really, really efficiently, right? Um, and so that's where the student goes for the last several, but there are some, some at the beginning where I can see the student really like, really wanting to engage, okay? Okay, so the last thing I wanna share with you are the essays, and I'm not gonna read these at all. Instead, I'm gonna give you a very high overview um, of what Turnitin presents to me when I open up that AI detector um, to look at these essays. So I have um, one student's essay, I mean, sorry, one student, who submitted essay two, which was that response to an argument, and then essay three, which was the culminating essay, which was repurposing a prior work to take a position. So, uh, and I know the student to have used AI and Turnitin is identifying some AI stuff. So I highlighted what Turnitin highlighted. Um, anything highlighted in blue is what Turnitin is saying the AI, uh, an AI produced. This student wrote their um, second paper on Animal Crossing. Uh, the student uh, uh, identified Animal Crossing as an argument, um, making claims about capitalistic ideologies um, uh, uh, by making the player aware of certain power relationships between characters in the game, making the, the, the player uh, experience perpetual debt, and putting the player of Animal Crossing in this position of really materialistic consumption, right? That's the driving sort of play mechanic of Animal Crossing. Super interesting stuff, really interesting stuff. This student also, their primary language is French. And when you look at this essay, you, one of the really cool things about this essay is the student is using their experience of playing the game uh, in French, right? So in the French version of the game, bells are right termed differently, right? And even the sources the student used to, to sort of deepen their knowledge about the game are originally written in French. Okay, and so this is a student for whom, and, and I think this is really interesting. AI is very good at translating. And I don't know how good Turnitin's AI detector is at detecting translated text, although I think that does pop up for us often and we need to be really careful about that. But this student didn't do the simple thing of, I wrote my essay in French and then I want something else to translate it for me and then I'm gonna just shoot it in. This student was careful to if, if they did use a translator, preserve the original French where it mattered, right? Where the student wanted to represent their language, their thinking about it, an object in their language, they preserve that. Um, and so there's just some decision-making evident in where there's AI detected and where there's not, right? What's really interesting to me about where the AI is used, and I'll scroll back up to the top. And again, it's okay if we can't read this. I just want you to have a high overlook. It's in the beginning, right at, right at the sort of introduction. It's between paragraphs. See, there again. And it's in the conclusion. When I look at that and when I notice that pattern, I see a student who did all the labor of doing the research organizing a paper around thesis elements and chunking out that discussion according to that sort of trajectory of an argument, and then using the AI to bridge because it's very good at synthesis, okay? So this thing will help me transition from this to this and from that to that, and then using the AI to write a conclusion and to start an introduction because it is also very good at that. And I'm really fascinated by that, okay? So that was essay two. And the same student who wrote that essay wrote this one. And I, I'm just gonna skim this one for you. Check, just check out where the AI shows up. So it's again in the introduction, not the thesis claim. 
but it's also in quite a bit of the rest of the essay, right? So you get some original chunks, but you also get some pretty long sort of prose generated um, by, by the machine, right? And when I think about this student, same student wrote that, that essay, wrote this one. Same student who's doing this fascinating stuff with Animal Crossing, doing really cool research in their own language, um, who then wrote this essay. And then I think about when this essay was written at the end of a summer session, which is only six weeks long for us, who was also taking a math class that was pretty heavy load. And just knowing that like that time frame for getting this done is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. The student made a decision and this is the decision they made, right? Okay. I wanna point one more thing out about this essay and then I'm almost done talking. We can open this up for discussion. I know that um, AIs can, can fabulate, right? They, 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 they generate plausible language um, and we'll do this for source cited, right? We'll do this for um, work cited and, and we'll come up with things that don't even exist. I just wanna point out that in this essay, the third one, um, when 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 you look at what Turnitin's AI will detect, it's identifying um, some AI generated text in the uh, yeah. works. Um, see here and see here, but that is totally the title of that source. Like Daft Punk's Daft Punk one more time official video or official audio. That is what that YouTube video is called and music and social movement, mobilizing traditions in this, uh, this one, language in action. If you go to that, let me see if I do it real quick. I'll just, you can trust me. That is the title of that article. So the AI is saying that this is fabulated. This is AI generated. That is not, that is a MLA citation copied from the original source. So we need to be very careful about just using the AI to assume that a student is, or using the AI detector to assume a student is using AI um, because we get false positives a lot. And these are, I know to be, a, um, be an example of a false positive, okay? Um, so I'm gonna send this to you. Last thing I'm gonna say before I, I be quiet and I open this up for some discussion. Actually, I wanna present some questions for us to grapple with. So that'll be the last thing I say, but last thing I say here. Um, I've been included in these materials, that very cool essay about Final Fantasy VII and climate change that everybody was freaking out about in the discussion. So if you are interested in um, what that student was saying, so you also can freak out about how good it is, you have access to that. Um, and Turnitin detects no AI generation in this. I don't know that that is the case. If if I think about, okay, that AI is all these things, autocompletes, autocorrect, voice to text, um, um, I'm sure the student used many tools in writing that essay, um, but but not the content generating kind that we're worried about, at least not the kind that uh, Turnitin can detect. So, okay, so let me open it up and uh, uh, land here. When I think about all of that work, journal work, discussion replies, the fact that when a deadline is approaching, students will revert to the pathway to their end goal that is at their fingertips. They will do that. Um, these are the tempting questions, right? Um, we could play with. How do I eliminate the possibility that students will use AI to complete their coursework? Uh, do I require all students to write journal entries on paper? Do I stop asking students to reply to discussion posts altogether? Do I require students to rewrite every single passage that turn it into text as AI generated? Do I proctor all my major assessments of learning and skill development? So those are the those are the questions I legit thought about <laughs> at the end of summer. Um, but taking a moment, stepping back, thinking of that framework uh, uh, I, I shared at the beginning, these these are perhaps other questions that that we could talk about um, together um, for the rest of the session. What evidence of learning is apparent in the coursework of our students who are using AI tools? So when I know a student to be using AI, what is apparent about that work that makes me think, no, learning is happening. It's right there. I can see it, right? So, so what can we point to and what can we share and what can we talk about? Um, the next question, how are we reflecting on our course design 
to mitigate the circumstances that lead to simple, plausible task completion. Meaning when I ask students to do something, is the learning engaging and the experience meaningful? Like they kind of want to be in the space. They, they want to grapple with that thing you're asking them to grapple with instead of just completing it. Um, is there enough time to complete that task meaningfully? Or, or is my course design really compressing the time they have to complete those tasks? So they're going to be going to the thing that can, is going to help them get it done. Um, and then are the modes of contributing and participating familiar and modeled? Meaning like I've, I've really scaffolded and shown them, okay, a paragraph structure that has these elements and we practice that together. And, and at one point they're familiar with it. Or are those things, that particular mode of expression, is it, is it, is it so distant or unfamiliar that I'm just going to go to something that will produce it for me? Because I, I still just don't get what you want me to share with you, right? Or how to do it. Okay. okay. So I wonder if there's things that we can think of and reflect on and share with each other with regards to that. And then the final question is, what equity implications are raised by considering AI as a tool for learning, mm -hmm. as well as considering AI as a simple, efficient pathway to completing tasks? Um, what equity implications could we could we identify together and share and, and discuss? Okay. So at this point, I'd really like to just open it up and 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 instead of doing the hand raise thing, I think we could try to just start talking. Uh, and if it gets loud and we talk all over each other, maybe we'll go to a hand raise protocol. Then. Um, maybe we could just jump in and. There might be some chat stuff I have not been paying attention to. So um, wherever we would like to start. Were there anything in the chat, Jim, that you feel like is a good, something I should respond to or, or bring it first or, nope, okay, cool. No, no, there's some good stuff, but I think moving towards some of these questions, uh, Maybe it would help us if you picked out like one question that you'd like to see us start with, because it feels like there's a lot here to negotiate. Maybe right. you could give us a, a leverage point. Yes, thank you. This is this is what, I, I'm not sure I will ever get better at this, but this is what I do to my own student. It's like, here's all the things. What do you want to talk about? And they're like, I can't talk about all those things. <laughs> okay, so maybe let's just start with the first one, just learning. Um, where is learning apparent in coursework um, where students are completing tasks using AI? Um, are we experiencing that? Or we could also refute that question and just say, I don't think learning is happening when students use AI because of, and then can we talk about a specific instance and we, maybe we can see if we can pivot back. I know I struggle a lot with my class in the sense that there's just so much stuff to get done in a short time. So I, I worry about that. Um, it's a lot. Some things is, I mean, the whole thing is AI because they're using software <laughs> for a lot of things. Right. But, but, but uh, like for the, I have a, I have a written part of my like biostats class that I teach that I, put my head in the sand last semester. I'm not gonna look. I don't think they're gonna know AI about ChatGPT just yet. I was wrong, of course. So I, after the exams, I went back and I checked the answers they've given and there've been quite a few ChatGPT answers, what looked like ChatGPT answers. And one of them was very wrong because yeah. ChatGPT Chat got it wrong. So I'm thinking of reusing that question and tell them to put it back in chat GPT and tell me why it's wrong or something like that, you know. Um, but sorry, another comment. I'm not sure I'm answering exactly what you're saying. But uh, one other thing I noticed is that I recently started using chat GPT a lot. Huh. Uh, slowly, I, I needed to, you know, I put my ideas about something I wanted to do. Uh, um, I was going to a meeting and so on. Uh, I put I'm I'm a bullet points type of person, but I needed a bit more, you know, flowery language. I stuck it in Chat GPT, and it gave me a little bit better. Then I s extracted it out, and um, and I was able to improve it. So there's learning as well to be had from using Chat GPT. It, like you were saying, improving the introduction and the conclusion, for example. Yeah. Um, there was one other thing I was gonna say. Oh, one other thing, though, I've noticed with AI is that it fools you into thinking you're good. Mm. Uh, for example, a simple thing is uh, using, um, I was doing the uh, Wordle puzzle, right? 
doing Wordle and then I do all the other stuff and I found, okay, I'm stuck on one word. I go and Google it and it gives me the answer and you complete the puzzle and you think, yeah, yeah I'm so smart. I did it, but I didn't. I just cheated. And it's becoming so natural to do that, right? So the, the line is blurring, I think. I so think so many I ideas. Love, <laughs> well. I love I love that as an analogy, the, the puzzle completion. And, and, and uh, but, but then, because what that, that does for me is it makes me think about where we place value and what our goals are in completing a puzzle. Right. For some of us, it's just the struggle. It's like the striving to complete the puzzle is where the good stuff is. And ch it's cheating because I've, 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 I've taken away from myself that experience. I, I've cheated myself out of that experience, right? But, but at one point, it's like I've, I've enjoyed it enough and now it sucks but I need to get this off my plate. So I need to complete it. And so there's a tool that helps me do that. But you don't worry that our brain and ability to think is going to decrease because we're not exercising our own brains. We're letting something else do it. I don't, I don't yeah. I don't want to get philosophical too, too much. But I think we've always worried about that, about the new thing. That, yeah. that like, you know, the calculator, what is that going to do to our ability to think, you know, quantitatively, well, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I, I don't know. I, yeah. <laughs> I'd like I'd like to interject um, if that's okay. Um, I've I've not been using Chat GPT per, in particular, but I've been using Pi AI only because um, uh, I heard somebody a couple of weeks ago talk. About it, so I gave it a try, and I've been asking it questions, uh, things that when I'm doing my research to prepare my classes, I I teach drawing. So many people word things in so many different ways that you don't really know what the actual thing is. And so um, as a practicing artist, I can kind of word it myself, but I'm not really sure if that's like, if that's, you know, completely correct. And so I'm just able to ask the Pi AI and have this conversation back and forth, but I am so knowledgeable about my subject when I recognize that it's saying something that doesn't make sense to me, I can go, hey, what about this? And it goes, and it tells me, hey, that's a good observation. And then we like kink it out and the wording keeps changing until I feel comfortable with, uh, you know, like a paragraph and then I'll reword it and put it in and say, how, how does this sound? And I've been really using it like kind of a, as, a, as a dialogue. And I feel like I'm learning leaps. I'm super excited. Like now I feel like I'm learning leaps and bounds. Yeah. The difference between me and my students is I have all this knowledge already for decades, right? So I'm not trusting AI on the front end, I'm skeptical by nature. And so when I'm reading what it's telling me, I'm able to say that, you know, that quite doesn't make sense to me because it it, it does get things wrong yeah. and it words things that sound really great, you know, but it's actually doesn't make sense. And so how do we get our students to use it in a way that is dialogical rather than just completing a task? Absolutely. And I think that's so key. Um, students will say that sounds good but not but 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 so but can they say why to them it sounds good or how it sounds fits what the task is asking for or beyond how it sounds what substantively is happening in that sort of you know paragraph or whatever it is it produced given the task or the reading or the the concept that we're asking them to explore the theme for this workshop is showing showing our work, right? And so, and, and what I'm moving a lot towards, get, you know, that journal assignment, it really situates the, okay, tell me what it says. That sounds good. Like, grapple with it in a way. Like, like, pull something out of the middle of what you just summarized there and link it to this, you know, art that we looked at or this concept we're talking about. Like, and, and you know, and if we can position that, this is where I'm trying to go in my own classes. How do I position that in a way where students like at a gut level, like want to explore that, like want to make that connection? As you're saying, get them to a dialogic encounter with these tools um, and, and, and leave a breadcrumb trail, some kind of record of, I saw the student there and I saw them here and it, right, they're showing their work along the way as they're, they're engaging with these things. I don't know if that fits. I wanna highlight something Shelly said uh, in, in the chat that I thought kind of gets at the problematics here and builds out on what people are saying. She wrote, uh, I think there's also a benefit in students gaining confidence through AI. 
So we've heard about people using it that way, just among us, right, as professionals. Yeah. But then this really nice problematizing of that, uh, that is a big challenge for my writing students in particular. But is that confidence real? Yeah. Will it transfer? Right. And that gets to the idea that we, as more experienced readers and writers, have a knowledge set that can reassure us that what we're doing is real. But a student who's a novice isn't going to be able to assess that as well, right? So this question of confidence and transferability is really uh, complicated. Yeah. I feel like I feel like uh, that you know even when you point even when the when when we point out that any answer could be different, right? Like it's you know the answers are stochastic; they're not always the same. They're they're like rolling the dice. And some of them, if you if you if you turn up the temperature and you ask for a more creative answer, some of them will be really wild, like and and feeling discombobulated. But I think that if you if you think about it, like we have to think critically. This is an informational source, just like a person might be, right? Like this may be an opportunity to really kind of drill down on like, how do we know? First of all, like skepticism is part of academia, right? Like you can be skeptical. You can be curious and skeptical. Like, huh, okay, you say that, but it doesn't seem like it matches my personal experience. So let me ask you some more about it, right? And if you allow it to be that, you know, professional reference, you know, it's the if it if it is the sum of human experience. That's a pretty powerful thing to ask questions to, you know, totally. like totally, totally. And I think I so I think the knowledge base and the access we have to a knowledge base in at the information level. Okay, that that yes. And and then what I hear Shelly getting at, it's like the confidence of how to share that knowledge base back. And Daniel's point in the chat is what we do as students as instructors is we we, we often, if not always, invite them to emulate us. It's like, here's how we do this, the methodology. Pick up this practice, pick up these habits, do it like us. Here's the vocabulary we use to talk about this thing. So we have a shared language so we can really go deep, right? Talk like this, memorize these terms, share them back with me. Let's practice that together. So, so Teaching in this way is asking students to emulate us. Now they have a tool that's very, very good at emulation and they can sound good. They can sound like they are in the discourse with us, but, but do they have, and, and this gets to, you know, uh, uh, do they have the practice to feel confident? Have they built up the habits to feel confident? So when I think about this sort of middle section questions, I'm rethinking my course design around how is my course sort of forming my students with habits, with routines, with like contingency plans when the first plan didn't quite work out so that they're gaining that confidence from their own practice within the course, right? And, and what that requires is a lot of self-reflection. It requires a lot of pausing. It requires a lot of, let's talk about our work and, and how we got here in our work Let's hear each other. Let's let's share strategies, um, and and where I feel like that can be frustrating is is Maha what you said earlier. It's like, but I have all the knowledge content that I have to get through, and and practice is sort of built in to my course design. They kind of pick that up along the way, or or I've always front loaded the practice, and the knowledge is something they pick up along the way, or maybe these synthesize really well, and this is how I'm reflecting on my course design. Um, um, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm kind of rambling now. <laughs> what I do in Zoom, sorry. <laughs> but it is helpful though, once you once I passed the exams through ChatGPT and I knew which ones ChatGPT got wrong, now I can use that answer yeah. and ask them to assess that. Right. It, I think too, it's also understanding how we ask it questions, right? Yeah. Like that really gets back to our intention and our practice, right? Because you may, and, and and like what you were talking about, Curry, right there, like maybe my intention is I really want everybody to know structure. So if they write something and let's say they even post, they you have them post like whatever you put it, you can use chat GTP, it's fine. And 
whatever you post, you know, I want to see what that is. And let's say that maybe what they say is, is these are the important parts of um, structure as in my class. Can you look at this piece of work that I did and tell me, are there elements of the structure that I'm missing? And then it comes back and says, oh, yeah, well, according to this ontology that you just gave me, yes, you're you're missing X, Y, and Z. And then could you give me some suggestions of ways that I could improve it? And then maybe it could. And then if they share that, like that's learning. <laughs> that that is that is in fact what, what how learning works, right? Yes. Yep. 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 So like I teach a uh, introduction to supply chain management. And if I was still in corporate, I would be using chat GPT to write the strategies for my supply base. So I am having my students <coughs> do that with Jet, Chat TBT if they want to, they don't have to, but they will need to know what questions to ask and be able to explain what the problem is yes. with Walmart supply chain or you know, um, the COVID vaccine, whatever the drama is this month. And then, um, but I, I wasn't sure, and I saw it in one of your essays, like there were citations yeah. Does does Chat GPT do that for you, or is that the student putting that in? Because that would be great. Then I could see where the student is connecting the learning from class and the readings yeah. to whatever Chat GPT is offering. But I wasn't sure how robust it is. Some will. Rick, do you want to answer this? Yeah. It it uh, it depends on what model you're connected to. Like for instance, Bing, which uses Chat GTP four, it's connected to the internet. So um, the stuff that OpenAI's chat GTP4 is connected to only goes through 2021. So some more recent like notations, it's not very good at. And sometimes it will hallucinate on them. So, you know, they can use it to generate references. They better check them though. <laughs> because, right because uh, especially if they're using chat GTP, if they're using Bing, it'd probably be pretty close. There'll be, it, it, there'll be some good ones. Yeah. But for instance, if I'm if my the textbook I'm using is OER, mm -hmm. um, and I'm saying you need to cite this text, right? Can they into ChatGPT say use this material? Yeah, I imagine probably yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it'll know it'll even say if there's for some reason it's not hasn't been ingested. In most cases, if it's OER, it has for sure. Like it's it was part of the original training data, so um, it'll know it. Yeah. But if it doesn't, for some reason, they'll say, I don't know it. And then, you, but there may be other training sets. You could use BARD, which is Google's version of ChatGTP, or you could use Bing and try alternate AI systems that 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 could deliver, you know, uh, um, elements that include that corpora, that have things that are connected to whatever it is that you're teaching. Yeah. The next piece after that is I have my students present on the findings and it's like, that's where I can assess. Did they absorb it to be able to have, we, we do a mock presentation to executives. So the executives will ask questions about like, well, what about this and that? Mm -hmm. And we can see if they really understand it or if they're, they're just wrote, wrote memorization. Yeah. That's brilliant. I, I, I love that. I think that that's, that's where the magic happens, right? And especially if you do it a couple of times, like so that they know that you're going to do it. Like the answers, I mean, like a lot, uh, I last semester, I waited too long. This semester, I started working on their projects early and I've been doing the same thing, right? Like I want you to, you know, give me a business plan. They're like, I can't remember. Business. No, we're going to just write it with chat GTP. This is how you do it. Write me a business plan on blah, 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 on this, on an information system. And then they do it. And then, okay, now tell me what it told you. Now explain what's good about it. What's not good about it. Right? Like it's a, it's interactive and they're t talking to each other about what's good and about what's good about it. What's bad about it. Right. And I can cover so much more than I could before because it's being written, like it's being generated. They look at it, wow, okay, my idea was about, you know, how do I integrate social justice into, you know, distribution of food for local charities? And 
AI has got a business plan. It's got the metrics. It knows everything on how it works suddenly, like immediately. And now they're talking about it. And it's like, that's amazing, right? That's where it gets really magic really fast. Yeah. I also like that move a lot, Annie, because it 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 puts it put it brings the dialogic back into the whole sort of interaction with the content, right? And it makes me think of like a course design move, like puzzle groups, where like the first group the students are in is, okay, you're gonna talk about this thing together. And it's easy for a student in that space to sort of kick back and let the two students talk about that thing for a little while. But the puzzle group move is, but in the second group, you're an ambassador of the first group. So your job in the second group is to tell them what your group talked about. And so now I am paying attention in the first group because I wanna have something to say in the second group when it's my, my turn. And so that course design, it adds a meaningfulness, a, a, a challenge, uh, something to strive for in that first task completion that engages that student at a deeper level. And so I like the, okay, we're gonna use these tools and it's gonna help us access some content. It's gonna help us access, maybe generate some questions, but there's this dialogic thing you're gonna be in, in, in the middle of in the next step. So you need to be nimble with those things. You can't just follow a script in the next space. So you're gonna have to play with that stuff in a way that you know you've internalized it. You have you have some 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 use with it. Um, cool. I know I know folks need to take off. Um, uh, let me so let me let me really quickly um, uh, I'm gonna share the link to this document so that you have it. This goes to everything that we covered, uh, including all that student content. Um, the last thing, and I won't read this, but I'll just show you that it's here. This is my current um, policy, uh, syllabus policy for AI stuff. Um, so this is what's in my syllabus. Notice I, I'm, what I've done is I've just centered that student's reflection. That's where I'm at in terms of a policy. It's like, we're all reflecting on this and, and I'm in a dialogue with you about how we're gonna use these things. I don't have a, a policy beyond that, except for, for essays, I'm telling them that I'm not gonna grade their essay or give them feedback on their essay unless they can show their work. I don't wanna proctor the essay writing process like in real time, but I wanna see the breadcrumb trail that got them there. So I have this in my syllabus description of a drafting process and then a rubric that I'm using for my like major assessments. I have what I'm calling a threshold requirement. So if they don't complete this requirement, I don't grade anything else, it's just a, come talk to me and let's have a conversation. But the complete is your final draft clearly uses ideas and language from Reno journal notes during classwork, stay on track reflection and draft outlines. I can see you moving ideas from space to space as they're evolving and you're engaging with them recursively. Or I can't see those things and I wanna talk to them so that I can hear the story of how they wrote that draft. And so they can email me and we can come have that conversation there or we can meet in real time and have that conversation there. Um, and I'm fine, and, and, and so I'm, I'm and, and the reason I'm sharing that with you is because where I am is I really wanna center sort of student work and students showing their work. Um, and that's as far as I've gotten in terms of how I feel like these tools, what, what I am to do with these tools uh, in terms of policies. So if you need to take off, thank you so much for hanging out. Really appreciate the conversation. Um, if you wanna stick around, I can stick around for a little bit. Um, and follow up. Otherwise, thank you. See you all soon. Thank you, Curry. Awesome. Thanks, Catherine. And Curry. See you, Rick. Awesomeness. You too. <laughs> hey, hey, Curry, I've got a question for you. Yeah, let me stop recording. Have, have you taken uh, any of your original works 